Today's video is about domain driven designs to holy grails. These are, in my opinion, the main reasons to learn and practice domain driven design and we'll cover them in today's video. But before we do that, I'm extremely excited to announce for the very first time my brand new course, Getting Started with Domain Driven Design. This course assumes you have no prior knowledge in domain driven design and takes you from the very basics up to some advanced topics in the end. We have this project that we're building throughout the course where we start from a pretty small application to three microservices speaking with a message broker and integration events. So I'm really stoked to be collaborating with Nick Chapsass and Dome Train on this course. Here's a 30 second teaser from the course. Welcome to getting started with domain driven design. What is domain driven design? The gym management also needs to listen to messages from the message broker. Let's separate it as have each one of the subdomains react in its own damage context. Three different microservices So if you're interested in domain driven design, then definitely check it out. I think this is the most comprehensive course covering all the theory that you need to know getting into domain driven design. Make sure to use the promo code over here. Only the first 200 will get a 20% off buying the course. Now back to the holy grail of domain driven design. So like I said, there isn't really just one holy grail, but domain driven design has two phases. There's the strategic phase and the tactical phase. Each one of them has its holy grail and the reason why we even go through this phase in the first place. So starting with strategic design, strategic design is all about exploring the problem space. We want to understand what we're facing for us to be able to say, okay, this is the problem that we're trying to solve. How do we want to solve it? This gives us insight into the solution space. That is how we decide to tackle this problem. So let's look at an example I think will make a bit more sense. So let's say we're building this dinner hosting platform. So similar to how an Airbnb, you can take your house and turn it into a hotel, or here you can take your house and turn it into a restaurant. So if we're looking at the problem space of this domain, what we really want to understand is what problem we're trying to solve. For this, we want to talk with domain experts and their various practices that we can take like event storming or event modeling, where we explore the problem space and we understand what different processes we have within our domain, what are the behaviors that we have within our domain. And most importantly, we want to have a mental map of the problem space so we can say, and this is the holy grail of the strategic phase, what are the bounded contexts that we have within our system? Now, the definition of a bounded context is a logical boundary in which a domain model applies. So back to the example that we looked at before, let's say that during the strategic phase, we start to identify various domain models. And these are the domain models that we've identified at least as a first stage. Now it's important to note that this isn't a linear process. So it's not like we identify or we map the problem space and then we come up with a solution space and then we identify the domain models and et cetera, et cetera. But it's a back and forth so we go ahead and explore the problem space. And while we're trying to figure out the solution space, we'll often go back and re-examine the problem space. And this is part of the exploration of how we want to actually model our software based on the domain that we're working in. So let's say as a first stage, we started noticing these domain models. If we decide to put everything inside a single bounded context, then we might have the following representation of our domain in a single bounded context. So again, what we're doing here is we're saying as a solution for the problem that we're trying to solve, which is the dinner hosting platform, what we're doing is we're creating a single logical boundary in which we put all the various domain models that are interacting with one another. So for example, we'll have the guest reserving a spot at a dinner and in the end there's a bill, et cetera, et cetera. This is one option for the solution space for our domain or for our problem space. But another solution for the problem space is the following bounded context. So we may decide to put in the user management context, only the domain models of a user, a host and a guest. Then in the dinner management context to put the domain models of the host, the guest, but also the menu, the menu review and the dinner. 
the user management context will be responsible for when user wants to create a host profile or a guest profile, then they interact with this bounded context. And when they want to go ahead and create a dinner or a menu, then they interact with the dinner management context. The representation of a host and a guest in the dinner management context will probably not be the same as a representation in the user management context. So when we say host in the user management context, we know that we're talking about the profile of the host that a user created. That may have much more data or different data than what the host has over here in the dinner management context. Because when we're talking about the profile, we don't care about the menus that the host created. But on the other hand, in the dinner management context, then we'll probably have a list of many. So again, the bounded context is the logical boundary in which a domain model applies. Now, if we're looking at the reservation context, then over here, we may have a bounded context in which the responsibility of the domain models and of the domain layer in that bounded context is managing the reservations. So does the dinner have enough room? If a guest wants to cancel a reservation, can they cancel the reservation or perhaps is it too late? Okay, so the holy grail of the strategic phase is to come up with the bounded context. This is how we're deciding the solution space will look like. Now, having only this bounded context as so isn't really enough because we also need to define the interactions that they have with one another. For example, when a user goes ahead and creates a host profile, this will go ahead and create a host in the dinner management context for the host to be able to interact with the dinner management context. So we can see that we have some relationship between these two bounded contexts that when something happens in this bounded context, it affects another bounded context. So the process of identifying bounded contexts and then doing context mapping, which is defining visually the representation between the bounded context is the holy grail of the strategic phase. Now, these domain models that we have within each one of the bounded context, they reflect the ubiquitous language of that bounded context, meaning that within each bounded context, we're forming our own ubiquitous language, which is a set of terms and terminology of a vocabulary that has a specific meaning within that bounded context. So when we're looking at the user management context, when we say host, we know exactly what host means. When we're talking about the dinner management context and we say host, it may mean something completely different. What we want to do is for each one of the bounded context to define and explicitly define the ubiquitous language and have the domain models reflect that ubiquitous language. This includes that, for example, when a guest reserves a spot in a dinner, we want the actual method to be called reserve spot if that's our ubiquitous language. If our ubiquitous language is catch a spot, then we'll want the method to be called catch a spot. But we want to explicitly define our ubiquitous language and have the terms and terminology inside each one of the bounded context reflect the ubiquitous language. So like we said, this is the holy grail of the strategic design or the strategic phase in domain-driven design, but there's another extremely important holy grail in the tactical design or the tactical phase of domain-driven design. So let's talk about that. So let's say we've identified something like this. Now, of course, in the solution space, it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one mapping of the various domains that we found. So for example, we have a domain of the users creating these various profiles. We can decide, and it's totally okay, to say we want to create one bounded context where host will mean one thing, but it'll contain inside also the things that we would have had over here and also over here. So in the solution space, we have the freedom to say, this is how I want to solve the problem and not in another way. These decisions reflect the priorities that we decided. So for example, we may say there is an off the shelf solution for managing various profiles on users. This entire thing can be delegated to an external system where we don't have to develop it in house. But on the other hand, these we do want to develop in house. So let's create one bounded context for all of this. Okay, we have the freedom to make these decisions. So let's say we have identified something like this. I want us to zoom in specifically on one of the bounded contexts. So let's say the reservation context, the holy grail of the strategic phase is looking at each one of these domain models 
and saying, how do they interact with one another? For example, will the reservation domain model be contained inside the dinner domain model? What drives these decisions are mapping the various invariants that we have in our system. So within the reservation context, we have a set of invariants. The invariants are business rules, things that must be valid at all times. So an invariant that we may have, for example, is that the number of spots reserved by all the reservations cannot be more than the maximum set by the host for this specific dinner. So this is an invariant that we need to enforce. Another invariant can be, for example, that a guest cannot cancel a reservation less than two hours before the beginning of the dinner. These are business decisions that we need to keep true. And what we want to do as part of the tactical phase is go ahead and create the smallest possible combination of domain models that we can enforce all the invariants in our system. For example, the constraint of reserving less than the maximum number of spots can drive the decision to put the reservation domain model inside the dinner domain model and creating a bigger domain model where the reservation is contained inside the dinner domain model. So let's stop beating around the bush and say what the holy grail of the tactical phase is, which is identifying the aggregates within each one of the bounded contexts. So the aggregate is the smallest possible combination or group of domain models that are needed to be batched together to be able to enforce the invariance. So again, it's the smallest possible combination of domain models that allow us to still enforce the invariance that we want to enforce. The reason why we want it to be as small as possible is because it allows us to be much quicker when we make business decisions. So when we make the decision of whether or not a user can reserve, all we need to do is in this example to get the dinner and the reservations inside it and look whether we're more than the maximum and that's it. Because the dinner domain model doesn't also contain the actual guests themselves that are part of this dinner, the object is much smaller. We don't need to fetch all this data from the database and the overall latency of the request will be lower. So again, we want it as small as possible. We're paying less money for the data, the throughput of reading and writing everything back to the database. Also, we have smaller objects in memory, meaning that the overall latency will also be lower. So just to recap, an aggregate is one or more domain models that always need to stay consistent as a whole. In the upcoming videos, we'll dive into these holy grails, specifically bounded contexts, how they interact with one another. Like we said, this is called context mapping. And we'll look at the various context map patterns, but also the second holy grail, the aggregates, needs to get a bit more attention because it is such a crucial part. We'll talk about invariance, ubiquitous language, everything that you need to know to understand these concepts fully. Now, a small disclaimer that I need to say is that even though I work at Microsoft, I'm not talking on behalf of Microsoft. Everything that I'm presenting are my personal opinions. So if what we talked about sounds intriguing, then make sure to smash the subscribe button, smash the like button, and I'll see you in the next one.